Um, now let's let's turn our attention to objective assessment. So really, I guess the first thing to discuss when it comes to subje uh, to objective is, do you want to be confirming your diagnosis of a tendon injury? And um, the main bulk of your assessment and uh, diagnosis of tendinopathy is from your subjective assessment. Um, so there's not really much that the palpation and special tests add to diagnosis of tendon injury. Yes, they are there. Yes, they're helpful. Yes, you can do them, but they don't really add that much. Uh, but there are other reasons to be looking at uh, palpation. I do find palpation useful for differential diagnosis of for example, bursa versus fat pad versus tendon, um, and those things are very useful. Um, they are not simple, not straightforward, especially in someone who has got some chronic uh, central drivers because everything tends to be hyperalgesic and it's hard to know, but they are something to look at definitely for a lot of these people. Um, the other thing to look at is what does the tendon look like? So observation of tendon uh, can give us a lot of information primarily about how is this tendon likely to function. So is there an energy storage issue? Um, so I've, I haven't had many patients with tendons that look like these, but I have had a couple and they are very difficult to do anything with and primarily because nothing happens when you do any type of exercise um, in the tendon. and. Um, people like this and they tend to be older with very progressed pathology, we know that if we look at the tendon we can see that or if it's on, if it's on ultrasound and you can see that they have got gross, gross, gross pathology, that may impact, in my opinion, their uh, prognosis for some of these people. Primarily their prognosis for developing function or redeveloping function. They can usually, we can usually manage their pain and it tends to be mainly by offloading, but they tend to struggle when it comes to redeveloping function. Uh, so most of these people are older and they just want to go back to walking anyway. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, palpation is useful for, and, and for, in my opinion this is the most important reason to palpate someone, is to pick up local and diffuse hyperalgesia. So if you're not palpating, you're never going to pick up hyperalgesia. Um, and that is very, very important. So are they sensitized generally around that tendon? Um, and that will give you some idea about, you know, some of your central drivers and some of the other things that are going on as well. <clears throat> and I think the key thing moving on from there in terms of assessment is to look at how that tendon is functioning under load. Um, and when it comes to assessing tendon function under load, uh, it really comes down to a couple of things for me. It comes down to what is the motor output of that person? So what is their function? Um, how are they moving? And that can be kinematics, that can be a number of different things that we look at. And the second thing is, what is their pain like? So very, very simple things. So how are they moving and how painful is it? So, so really, really uh, straightforward. Um, so when you're looking at kinematics, um, I tend to start off with easy things like walking, stairs, sit to stand, and depending on your patient groups, obviously with a gluteal tendon that is just walking, that might be all you do. Um, uh, with, patients, with patients that are more um, advanced, so for example, Achilles patients that are running, patella patients that are jumping, you might add in some more higher intensity type, um, uh, type loading and assessment things like getting into hopping, getting into running, getting into jumping. And obviously this is going to be limited by pain. So day one may not be the right time depending on how, many, how much they have in terms of symptoms. And you would have gleaned that already from your subjective assessment. So your subjective assessment of irritability is key for uh, deciding what type of functional assessment you'll look at. Uh, but if you're looking at, doesn't matter what you're looking at, could be any of these things, um, the types of things that we look for are stiff strategies. So stiff strategies are very important when it comes to tendon. What I mean by stiff strategy is someone who hops or someone who squats and they don't get much range when they do that functional activity. Um, so stiff strategies are really um, not good for tendons because you tend to get an increased loading rate. So because it's stiff, the loading rate on that tendon is higher 
um, and you tend to get peak forces that are much higher. Um, so stiff strategies are not good. Uh, we look for poor eccentric control. So a good example of this is when someone's hopping and they're landing. So looking at how much control they have. Um, we look for coronal and transverse plane deficits. And again, it depends on the tendon you're looking at. So I tend to separate tendons into sagittal, sagittal plane tendons versus coronal plane tendons. Um, coronal plane tendons are things like tibialis posterior, um, things like gluteal tendons because they operate primarily in the coronal or frontal plane um, and therefore you want to assess carefully what the coronal and frontal plane kinematics are in these patients. Okay, uh, And we'll get to a couple of examples of this. Um, and then you're looking at just control of movement and you know, do they have balance issues? How are they controlling movement? So this is what I spend most of my time looking at when I'm looking at a tendon patient, taking them through that pathway of how can I assess uh, what, what their um, movement strategies are like in functional activities that are specific to their function and to their type of loading uh, and also to their level of symptoms. Um, so a couple of examples then. Uh, I'll probably play the video, it might make it easier. So this is a patient who has a stiff ankle strategy. Okay, so you can see, oops, that's all. <laughs> so he's got, um, he's got a very stiff ankle strategy when he lands. And, oops. So that's quite a common finding in an Achilles patient. And um, what we're looking for is what are the underlying reasons for that stiff ankle strategy? And they could be pain. It could be a learnt behaviour. So you may have had pain uh, and that pain is, has recovered, but the sensor and motor strategy has not recovered. Um, and he's still got that underlying motor pattern or that underlying neurotag that is, that is causing that um, motor behaviour. He may have an ankle or calf flexibility issue that's causing that. Um, or he might be some other and multiple neuromuscular deficits in that kinetic chain. So it could be a power deficit in his calf. It could be a deficit in his knee uh, that's causing stiffness in his ankle. So, um, so looking at um, these factors, you can start to untangle what the movement strategy is related to. Another example which we're all familiar with is looking at someone who's displaying a dynamic knee valgus pattern. Um, so again, you're looking at what are the contributors to that dynamic knee valgus pattern. Um, are there distal kinetic chain issues in terms of ankle and calf flexibility? Are there dynamic foot posture issues? Um, and are there neuromuscular deficits uh, looking at both the proximal and the distal kinetic chain? So, um, so that's probably a more straightforward um, example. So the other thing you want to assess, apart from their, uh, their strategy of movement, you want to look at what their pain with loading is like. So with their pain uh, on loading, uh, we tend to look for, um, is it, the, the primary question, is it high or low tendon load that they're getting pain with? So I do see a lot of patients that have pain with calf raising, which is not a, a common thing. Um, and you've always got a question, is there a central component, is there a central driver? And the first thing to do is take them aside, do some work on them, uh, see if you can change that pain. Uh, see if you can uh, change it in the short term with simple interventions. And if you can, that is an indication that there may be a central driver rather than tissue irritability. Okay? So um, low load activities, you're looking at an irritable patient or you're looking at someone with um, non-tendon pain or a central driver. Um, if they've got a central driver, generally they'll change quickly. So their pain can change quickly with, with, uh, with you know, soft tissue work, um, with, uh, with um, uh, manual work in general. So is it low load or high load activities? Um, the other thing to look at is, and this is really important, does their pain limit motor output? So does the pain they have limit motor output? Um, and this is, this is very variable. So sometimes they doesn't limit motor output at all. So for example, I saw a netballer today um, who's four weeks into her season and I've been seeing her for something like 
well, the whole time since I've been back in this country, uh, so two and a half years for patellar tendinopathy, um, and uh, she hasn't missed a game at all, but she's, got pa she's had pain pretty much the whole time. And um, we, um, uh, she reports a seven or eight out of 10 pain with single leg decline squat, but it doesn't affect her motor output at all. So she's got a high intensity of pain, but it doesn't affect her motor output. She can still hop and she has a very good power in her, in her hop and jump. So, so that's important because those people generally are going to be stable in their pain pattern and they're also going to be, um, they're also going to be ones that you don't necessarily need to offload if they have high intensity. So intensity of pain is very subjective in terms of report of intensity of pain. Um, and often people with a high intensity of pain have a lot of central drivers as well. So there's other things aside from tissue that may be contributing to that intensity of pain and, and its perception of pain. So, um, so that's a good indication to me that she doesn't have tissue type irritability that we need to offload her from. Um, then you might have people who have um, a high um, severity, um, sorry, uh, then you have, yeah, this is, that's, the, that's the sort of girl that I'm talking about there. So um, they have a high severity but not, no, um, uh, no effect on motor output. And then other people on the other end of the spectrum, they're severely affected in terms of their motor output. So they have huge issues in terms of motor output that are associated with pain. And these people often are irritable, often have a tissue underlying component. Not always, they can be centrally driven and you need to, as with all these things, it is a package of all the information uh, that will give you that answer about central versus tissue. Um, but these people are different. The key thing about these people is that we know we need to offload them. So they're irritable and they have an impact on motor output. So we can't get them to do hopping or we can't get them to do activities that are going to uh, cause these huge issues in motor output. So if I go back to this person, um, if I got this person to start hopping, oops, if pain was causing his hop, um, uh, I, I couldn't get this person to start hopping because it would, uh, it would accentuate this uh, sort of um, pain response by the high loading race and the, and the stiff ankle strategy. What I might do with this person as a, as, a, um, as a test, depending on his irritability, is try and retrain his hopping pattern. So try and get him hopping with a more, uh, with a smoother hopping strategy and try and get him to touch his heel down. Now that's provided there's no structural issues like an ankle issue that won't allow him to do that. So, uh, so, the, so the key for me is, can I improve the motor output? Can I firstly assess the motor output and then improve it in a way that's going to uh, reduce the uh, concentration of load at that muscle tendon unit, okay? Um, so that's the important thing about assessing these motor outputs. Often they will be related to uh, increased load at that area. Um, and the other thing to be aware of, the other thing to be really aware of with these patients is how much apprehension do they display? Um, so look at their facial expressions. Look at how they anticipate movement and how they anticipate pain. Because often you'll get someone and on their affected side, and I see this a lot with the gluteal patients, they have a real hesitation and an anxiety about standing on that leg. Um, and that is a real level of central anticipation of pain that is going to definitely feed into uh, those pain mechanisms and, those, and that pain perception. Um, and the other thing that we talked about was the lingering type symptoms. So have they got symptoms uh, that are lingering, um, which is not uh, really something that we associate quite closely with uh, tendon pain. Um, patient reported ability and perception. So it's, I try and get an idea of them about how comfortable do you feel hopping? How comfortable do you feel running? How comfortable do you feel doing a squat? Because often that can give you indication again about their perceived rating of themselves in terms of their ability to do that. Um, and again, their fear avoidance and, and factors like that. So in terms of a summary of functional assessment that you want to get from some of your tendon patients, 
it is important to look at kinetic uh, deficits um, and really more than how they're moving look at what are the causes of that underlying movement pattern so is it pain or is it other issues um, and is it related is it something that we can change functionally so probably not something I can describe very good in this format but looking at can we sh can we make a change to their movement pattern and their motor output in, in the short term um, by changing the way they move giving them certain cues um, or doing things in the short term and that's often an indication that they uh, have the underlying ability in terms of their uh, musculoskeletal system to make changes and we're looking at sensor and motor um, input for these people. The other thing to get from a functional assessment is is there any t signs or evidence of tendon irritability? So are they having pain with lower load activities? Um, and is there evidence of non-tendon pain? Um, so are they having any lingering pain response? Are they having any, you know, do they display uh, any sort of top-down type um, uh, central drivers? And is there evidence of, yeah, top-down central drivers? Okay.